Uh, Hello. Yeah. Hi. Uh, that's Alec. Hello. Hi. Oh, yeah. Yo. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Um. All right. Right before we uh right before we get started. Um. Yeah. Vitalik, like, how how are you? What, what you get up to today? And also, welcome to Hack Club. Yeah. We're super super excited to see you here. Um. Are you able to hear us? Give him a second. Maybe he's still getting his audio worked out. Yeah. Probably. All good. Hello. Hi, Gabe. Yes. Um. Uh, Vital, testing. can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Can you oh, hear me? Awesome. Oh, fantastic. Heck yeah. All right, sweet. Um, yeah, I guess we can just go ahead and, and get started. Um, Vital, welcome to Hacklo. We're the, we're the world's largest network of amazing high school programmers, makers, designers, and hackers. And we are so stoked to have you here today. Um, through this entire call, we'll be talking about the philosophy behind ETH, to cool founding stories, politics, and more. Um, all of that and a lot more to come. But first, um, I guess we should introduce ourselves. Um, I'm Rishi. I'm a 16-year-old hack clubber from Toronto. Yeah, and I'm Claire, and I'm a 17-year-old hack clubber from both LA and Boston. Uh, so. Thank you so much for giving us one hour with you. Um, we're super, super excited to be able to ask you questions uh, for fear of being invasive. And so for the first two minutes, uh, Rishi and I will be kind of just asking some of our own questions and chatting about some popular ideas. And then we'll open the questions to the rest of Hack Club, who are all in the Zoom call and you can probably see that everyone's like super excited. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, and you know, everybody has like an absolute, like a, a ton of questions to ask you. So we'll be moving pretty quickly to get through them all. Perfect. Yeah. Cool. So um, this is just for people in the call who are just joining. Um, kind of introducing Vitalik. Um, maybe for you, this is like deja vu. But if you know him already, he was like a 30 second summary. He immigrated to Canada, <clears throat> Canada, when he was eight with his family, dropped out of the University of Waterloo after winning a medal at the IOI to build the Ethereum Foundation as part of the Theo Fellowship, where he actually met Zach, which some of you guys might know, hopefully, the mm -hmm. founder of Hack Club. And eventually he became the youngest crypto billionaire on the planet. Heck yeah. And without further ado, let's let's go ahead and get things kicked off. All right. So I think before we get into anyone else's questions, Rishik and I have had many existential crises about this. And I guess I'm just curious about how you were in high school, since all most of us here are also in high school. Like, how did you perceive your future? And if like maybe a lot of us are interested in many, many different things, how did you? Did you know what you were going to be in the future or do you have like any dreams? I guess just like, how does you perceive your future? You just plan that out. Mm, um, I feel like at the beginning of, the, of uh, high school, the answer for me was not really. Like I was still learning. Um, I was uh, exploring. I was trying to just uh, do my best to you know, understand as many, um, as many things as I could. Um, so I first uh, heard about Bitcoin in uh, 2011, which was uh, about halfway through grade uh, 10 for me. Oh, wow. And, actually, um, sorry, halfway through grade 11. Um, yeah, so, and that was definitely like the furthest mm -hmm. one uh, kind of like big thing that I just saw on the internet and just found it immediately is like very interesting and very attractive. <laughs> and I just thought like, hey, this is a really cool thing. And like, how about I'll just actually try to get, get into the community and like earn some Bitcoins by yeah, writing for Bitcoin Weekly and like actually, yeah, and, like do things as in, in the yeah, Bitcoin community. Um, so I guess I yeah, reached out to the guy who was doing uh, Bitcoin Weekly. It was this uh, magazine for Bitcoin, like online magazine for Bitcoin that existed at the time. And he was offering five Bitcoins per article for me to write articles. And oh, wow. five Bitcoins, um, I mean, at the time it was worth like $4. So I was earning about a dollar an hour. Um, but it, this was like the only way I, I had of getting any Bitcoins. And I, yeah, so, you know, it's, it's like, wow, I get to actually interact with these magic internet objects. And it was uh, so exciting. Um, so I, yeah, I think that was probably the first thing that kind of really yeah, just attracted me in this uh, like it, it just in the sense of like wow this is something cool and I want to um, spend time as part of it. Um, I don't think I yet you even then really had an impression that like anything in that space would you know be my future in some sense like I was uh, at the time, like I think I wasn't sure, and almost everyone wasn't even sure that the crypto thing was 
going to like going to stay and like everyone just thought of it as, as this really small thing and maybe it'll go away maybe it won't maybe it won't go away um and so i was looking into bitcoin at the same time i was taking these uh online classes of, uh, of uh, for machine learning um and uh, doing a couple of other things and i think um the thing that kind of really flipped uh, me into like actually believe like believing in cryptocurrency and wanting to go into mm -hmm. it full time was um, later in uh, 2013 when I was in uh, university. I uh, oh, okay. went to the yes the the Bitcoin conference in San Jose, and I just uh, saw like saw for the first time like how big and how real the space was. Like you know, it's not just a bunch of people on the internet. Like there's over a thousand people there in person. There's uh, people who have companies. There's uh, people actually doing all sorts of really yeah, actually, uh, pretty advanced and complicated projects. And like that really gave me a confidence of just realizing like, hey, this isn't like just you know, a few people on the, uh, on the internet doing this part time. Like this is something that lots of people really believe in. And mm -hmm. like that gave me the energy, that definitely gave me the energy to sink in uh, full time. But before then, I think like I was just mostly, you know, exploring and just try looking, like trying to find things that I was excited about and, and uh, kind of trying my best to get into them and participate in them. Oh, so you're just like kind of surfing. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. And I think that's really cool because a lot of us are in like 10th and a half grade. And I think um, mm -hmm. it's really cool. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, so, you know, I, I guess like piggybacking off of Claire's question, um, you know, a lot of us in high school, um, we're also exploring, um, you know, some interesting exponential technologies. Blockchain is one of them. Um, so I, I guess like, why did it take you so long to, you know, kind of get sold on Bitcoin? Um, and like, how, how were you thinking about that early on? I think uh, Bitcoin was very attractive to me at the beginning uh, because it like really combined um, a lot of ideas that I was already interested in. Um, so I uh, already really liked math and I already really liked programming and uh, Bitcoin had uh, lots of math and lots of uh, programming in it. And like the other interesting thing I think that's different, that was different between Bitcoin and like a lot of the other technologies is that Bitcoin is actually very simple. Like you can explain how Bitcoin works to even an average high school student. And yeah. like, that's not true for, um, you know, ZK Snarks, for example, right? I mean, like, I try my best, and like, I think it's, I think we've actually gotten better at uh, like making uh, ZK Snarks kind of very understandable to like people who are, who are math, like, smart and able to kind of un think through the principles, but you know, haven't like kind of gone through the university education. But like, Bitcoin isn't even like at that level. It's just, you know, you have hashes, you have blocks, you have transactions. And if you just look at it for a bit, you actually can get it. And seeing something that's both new and that's both like accessible to people who haven't had like the big, long, deep educational background in that way is definitely yeah, something that's uh, really special about the space. I mean, it's, I think it's something that we should be trying to kind of make sure is, uh, is true of many other spaces. But so there were the math and the technological aspects. Um, also, some of the social and political aspects, like I had been just at the same time, re like reading and getting interested in like, things like Austrian economics and like monetary <laughs> Austrian policy. economics, interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, like just big, uh, and also I had been uh, really into um, open source software. So even before I learned uh, learned about Bitcoin, like I yeah, I had already started using Linux. I had already yeah started um, you know really getting on the kind of like open source everything train. Um, and uh, there just happens to be some very, some lovely people and uh, older students in high school that that really introduced me to those ideas. So you know, I really strongly believed in this idea of like software being this open and free thing, and you know, not being controlled by kind of any one uh, um, any one company that keeps everything closed. And like Bitcoin just happens to like combine all of those uh, interests together, which is uh, definitely amazing and unexpected. Oh, well, that's yeah, totally. interesting. I love how reading economic books kind of inspired you because that's that's really interesting. Yeah, I know a lot of people really into econ books in the Austrian school, so that was notable for me. Yeah, and I know a lot of people on this call can totally sympathize with like the, the free and open source model of thinking about software. I really love that. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Vitalik. Um, it's finally time to open up the field for questions to all of you. Um, for all of like the new people joining the call right now, um, just going over like the question protocol again. If you have one, feel free to DM your question to Christina in Zoom. 
Um, we'll tell you in advance if you're next. Um, and when you do get called up, just make sure to introduce yourself with your name, your age, and where you're from. Um, so yeah, let's go ahead and uh, get, get the first person on board. Um, Andrew, you wanna, you wanna go ahead? Hey Vitalik, my name is Andrew. I'm 13 and I'm from Toronto. So one of like my, my main question is what challenges did you face when you built Ethereum? I think the challenges that I was the least prepared for are the people challenges. Like, I feel like I was able to, you know, solve the math problems and, um, you know, like under, understand how consensus algorithms work and all of those things. But like actually, yeah, putting together a team, um, making sure that you have the right team, um, dealing with like differences in like values between y yourself and other, and other people on the team. Like those are you know, like the things that that are like that I feel like I was much less prepared for. Um, and like I think going into the crypto space, I definitely had this kind of very idealistic vision of uh, the yeah, like what I was doing um, that like this is this um, you know open blockchain project that's there that's uh, there as this kind of public good to improve the world. Um, and I did not appreciate from the beginning how like at least some of the other people that that um, were around were like taking a much more profit oriented approach to the thing like they yeah just basically yeah were really interested in this uh, in this as an opportunity to make money um, mm -hmm. and that like that uh, like like basically that kind of, like that divide that I did not even realize existed at the beginning um, ended up um, um, causing a lot of problems. Um, so I think, uh, you know, to anyone starting a new project, it's uh, definitely, yeah, like, I, I think important to that, you know, if you work with co-founders, then find co-founders that you uh, kind of understand and trust and uh, make sure that you're working with people who have uh, values that are um, aligned with, um, aligned with you. Yeah, <laughs> and just one more thing. How did you, like, overcome those challenges? Mm, um, I think, I mean... My honest answer is like not very successfully and it took a long time. Like basically, eventually, like there were a lot of conflicts. There were conflicts many times. Um, and the a lot um, a lot of the um, other people um just like fell away for for uh, for different reasons. So like today the Ethereum Foundation team is one that I'm very happy with and I, I think uh, you know we get along very well and uh, understand each other very well and we want uh, very similar things. But like it did take a long time to get there, and there were like a couple of rounds of uh, like us trying to find new people, then realizing that there's problems with those new people and those new people having to leave. Um, so I guess uh, like we handled it slow, like fairly slowly. Um, though the the good the I guess the best thing that happened was that we had some very good developers that could just keep building Ethereum uh, through all of this and made sure that the project uh, did really well. Um, and, mm -hmm. but I mean, aside from that, like I do think that, you know, there are things that I could like go back in time and tell myself today to make everything happen much more quickly. Um, yeah. yeah, it's really, it's really cool how your the team is a lot more stable and you've pro progressed as a team. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, the people part, I could totally understand that. I know there's quite a lot of founders in this in the Hack Club who haven't had to work a lot with good founders. So I'm sure some people are like laughing in here. Uh, all right, so our, our next question comes from Ishan. So mm -hmm. go ahead. Um, so hi, I'm Ishan. Uh, I'm in Seattle right now. Uh, and a lot of the Hack Club culture is about making silly, uh, fun projects, which uh, are technically interesting. Uh, so my question was, what's what's your hackiest project or your your silliest project idea? So, like recently, I I tried making a cryptocurrency from scratch, and then I added emoji addresses to it. So, yeah, what what's your hackiest project or your silliest project idea? Just hackiest and silliest project ideas in general. Um, yeah. Huh. I feel like there's like a lot of, like. If you're willing to like really do the effort and like like go into the like more advanced math with uh, the some of the zero knowledge stuff, I feel like there's a lot of like actually really like really fun ideas that you could do there. So like 
you could like for example like you can make a proof like you can make a, a idea project where like basically you pick 10 people like you pick any 10 people um including yourself and then you publish a message and that message comes with a signature that says this message was signed by any one of these 10 people but we don't but you don't actually reveal which one it was sent which one it was sent from Right, so like oh, you wow. could tag, um, you know, yourself, me, Elon Musk, four other people, and like just like make this tweet and say, hey, one of these seven sent it, and you know, you could just like have people on the internet like guess which one, um, which one of those seven it was. Um, so you know, right. I think like that's kind of pretty high on the fun and silly, um, and yeah. also uh, pretty high on the like if you do this, you'll learn a, um, a lot of math along the way. That that is also technically interesting in a technical way. So. That fulfills all the criteria. Thank you. I'm guessing you're someone that really likes puzzles um, or enjoys puzzles. Hmm. Uh, I also had another question. What's what's your favorite project other than Ethereum? Like, what's your second most favorite project of yours? Ah, uh, that's a good question. Um, let's see. I think I mean I like Zcash. Um, like I think uh, they're working on very interest interesting technology. And I think they are very, um, like, they're very, like, principled and honorable people. Like, uh, like, I just appreciate the fact that, like, they're just, like, they really care about privacy. Privacy, privacy is important to them. And they just want to make a blockchain with privacy. Um, and they're just, like, very driven on, uh, on doing their best on, um, on making that happen. Um, so that's a team that I really respect. Um, I would say, hmm, let's see, uh, I meant one Tezos of your projects. would be one, um, hmm? uh, I meant one of your projects, so something that you made, which is uh, the second favorite after Ethereum. Oh, oh, I see, it's something that I made other than Ethereum, um, yeah, I mean, okay, I mean, I guess, like I've made a lot of little things. So like, for example, I've made a lot of Python um, libraries for, for doing various cryptography things. So okay. like there's nice. one, yeah. So like there's one for elliptic curve pairings and just elliptic <gasps> curve cryptography. There is one for um, interacting with Bitcoin that I wrote back in 2013 that some people still use. There, oh, there, wow. <laughs> hmm, yeah, there are a bunch, the, um, there are a bunch of these. Um, yeah. There is um, my, um, oh, so my blog um, for that, um, basically, yeah, so this is the Vitalik.ca. Um, so oh, originally okay, it was on a Jekyll, but then Jekyll just started being too slow to like actually, up, uh, to actually update. And so I, I just ended up basically writing my own like blog publishing thing. So just like takes a bunch of markdown files, like creates the table of contents, compiles them, like makes it uh, makes it all look really nice, and just like generate like generates the entire website automatically. So that's also something that I have on GitHub. Um, so that's uh, just a very useful tool that allow that just allows me to you know create this blog without it, without needing to de like act, depend on any um, any other software packages from anyone else, and like I just use it for everything I write. All right, thank um, you. Yeah, that, that's amazing. And I know a lot of hack lovers can like totally relate to rolling your own, um, yeah, rolling your own static site generator. A bunch of people in this call have, have done that too. And I mean, most of us are huge fans of Next.js. Um, so yeah, <laughs> next up yeah. is, uh, like, yeah. Um, yeah, next up is Daryl. Daryl, you want to ask your question? Hey, Vitalik. Um, I'm Daryl. I'm 21 years old. Mm -hmm. And I've been lurking around Hack Club ever since I helped organize a hackathon at my high school about four years ago, uh, plus also tax free. And uh, just over one year ago, I was attending um, school uh, from home and I discovered Youth Online and was totally inspired to drop out of college, uh, my computer science degree, and participate in various Ethereum and Web3 related hackathons um, uh, hosted by Gitcoin, Youth Global, and Youth Denver, and all those guys. And long story short, I am now working full time as a front end developer at a decentralized crypto exchange you might have heard of, BYDS. So, uh, yeah, my question is um, if there were a parallel universe exactly the same as ours, um, except that hard forks and Satoshi Nakamoto never published their Bitcoin white paper, how long do you think it would take for a blockchain similar to Ethereum to be invented and go mainstream? And how might things be different? 
Ooh, that's a good question. Um, let's see. I think uh, like when Bitcoin was being invented, there were already like a lot of these other ideas that were floating around, right? Like there was like B money, E gold, uh, um, people like Wei Dai and Adam Back and all of these guys. I feel like if Bitcoin wasn't like didn't come out first, then they would have tried to do something like maybe yeah within five or ten years. I guess the like the question is what kind of thing would it have been right so like for example would it even have used proof of work as a consensus or would it have just like started with proof of stake from day one and would they just have like distributed the first few like million coins to like people if they prove they have a twitter account or whatever like things just could have like like i think that those kinds of things just could have happened in so many different ways um the, and then, of course, there's the question of like, would it have even started as a Bitcoin like thing, or would they just have like actually thrown in a better programming language right from the beginning, right? Because like the tools to make VMs and make programming languages like have just kept getting better on their own. Um, and so I, I, I think it could have been easier to do in like 2015 than it was, than it was in 2009. Um, so, yeah, I guess my answer is that probably, you know, we would have seen the same thing. Um, maybe at most a decade later, maybe yeah, maybe like even um, less than five years later. But I think like a lot of the details, uh, like easily, and a, even a lot of the principles could have been very different, right? Mm. So, mm. yeah, that's interesting. And I guess like you talked about proof of state or like proof of identity. I feel like that would be well, interesting if it was like a decade later. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, thank you for that answer. So our next question comes from Hugo. So take it away. Or I guess Hugo has a mic while I'm sorry. So then we'll just go to um, Harsh instead, if that's OK. Well, uh, Hugo. Uh, hello. Uh, I'm Harsh, and I'm from India. Mm -hmm. And my question is that, like, what other problems of computer science do you think, uh, like, are you excited by? And if not Ethereum? Or like if Ethereum was somehow a solved problem, what else would you be working on? What else would I be working on if Ethereum was a, a solved problem? Um, good question. I think, uh, let's see. Um, one thing I could be doing is I could just be kind of like helping the zero knowledge cryptography space along. Um, like there are some things that I really believe do need to be done. So like, for example, like just better like an easier to understand tools to make uh, to kind of, like make um, all of this stuff more all of that stuff more accessible um maybe yeah, because like one of one of my yeah, like concerns with the zero knowledge space as it exists right now is that people are basically writing these really complicated programs and then just compiling them into these mathematical objects and we don't really under look people aren't really doing much to like actually inspect those mathematical objects and like check the, whether or not everything makes sense. And so it might be easy for bugs to sneak through. Um, and especially in a space where like the, the whole concept is like, we're trying to be trustless and we're saying like, hey, you know, like this technology is all about people being able to like work together without having to, you know, like trust one person to do to do everything correctly. Uh, like having that technology actually be understandable and be kind of legible like it'd be possible to kind of open the box and see like what all the wires are doing is something that's really important so that's one thing i could be doing um so, so and then i guess things in cryptography in general um aside from that i yeah uh, i mean i I guess um, I could also see my uh, like see myself doing more writing full time. I've definitely, I mean, writing is definitely something that I've sort of done part time pretty much since the beginning, right? From Bitcoin Magazine, and even since then, just like a, a lot through my yeah, work at Ethereum. And there's probably a lot more things that I um, that I could talk about. Um, there's other in uh, industries aside from crypto that I could that I could easily be interested in, like building new cities might be one example. Like something in life extension or biotech might be another oh, example. Um, yeah, I'm so yeah. excited about biotech. That's really interesting. That's really cool that you're into a whole bunch of different fields. I feel like that makes me feel a lot better about mm -hmm. being 
kind of dreaming about a lot of different alternative professions. Um, yeah, uh, so I, I guess Hugo uh, had a mic problem earlier. So Hugo, if you want to ask your question now. Yeah, so um, I, I wanted to ask if you like think that cryptocurrencies or like blockchain in general can become like mainstream in society. And if you do think that, like, do you think there's a way to overcome, like, I guess the slight differences, like, that are like based by blockchain over like conventional systems, including like banking systems, such as like for cryptocurrencies, there's usually less, like, there's more fraud, I guess, than like if you mm -hmm. stored your money in a bank somewhere. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, a good question. I think, um, let's see, the, um, and uh, like, I think if for probably the next few years, the, the like crypto is going to continue to be uh, something that's like most valuable to people who are just like really completely ex uh, uh, like excluded from the financial system for various reasons. Right, so like there are people, who, still quite a quite a few people who have problem like th that problem even like in like places like Canada and the United States. But especially if you look at like underdeveloped countries, Nigeria, um, Latin American countries, for example, like there is a lot of uh, people there that just don't have good access to global finance. Um, they uh, don't have. Uh, um, you know, good access to like the same kinds of assets and the same kinds of investments that or people do. Sometimes it's even hard for them to save money because their countries have very high inflation. And so if you're like in that kind of a situation where you have this really big need, then like, I mean, you know, high transaction fees, you can deal with that. Like some risk of fraud, you can deal with that because like in Argentina, if you store your money in a bank account, it's not safe either, right? Like one day you wake up and the government announces that like they did a 50% haircut and that's actually happened before. Um, so I think, you know, in the short term, like it's, uh, well, like the like real usage is going to, fo we'll focus on like those kinds of places and it will continue to just look more like a separate system and that system will kind of get better and better on its own. Um, and I think over time as that system gets better and as we uh, like get better at um, solving uh, some of the yeah, uh, uh, some of the problems uh, that we yeah, have, then people will just like naturally become more and more and more willing to use it and more and more willing to like, just integrate it with, uh, I, I guess, the way that the yeah, economy and society works so, um, already. Like entropy yeah. of this natural system, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, that, that, that's super interesting, especially with, um, you know, places like El Salvador that are starting to integrate, you know, Bitcoin into, like, into and Estonia. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Um, all right. Next up is Ellie. Um, yeah. You want to go ahead and ask? Yeah, sure. Um, I was just wondering, like, uh, what kind of projects did you work on as a teenager? And what got you interested in coding? And when did you start? Mm, um, I got into coding. Uh, um, so the way that I first learned programming is I uh, basically started like writing video games um, and then for myself to play and then playing those video games. And then like I, uh, whenever I got bored of one, I would write a new game and then I would play it. And this is basically just how I taught myself to code pretty much from when I was 10 all the way up to when I was around 16 or 17 or so. Um, Mm -hmm. That's interesting. And like, uh, typically, on, like on a typical day as a teenager, like how how much time did you spend coding? How much time did I spend coding? Um, it depends. Like sometimes less time and sometimes more time. Um, I think like I guess any probably like anywhere up to when well, well, um a couple of hours a day. Um, like sometimes less. Sometimes like mm -hmm. sometimes up to that amount. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great, sweet. Um, yeah, I, I guess like piggybacking off of Ellie's question, um, you know, are, are, is there any big piece of advice uh, that you give like a 16 year old your age? Um, yeah, a, a lot of us are starting off on our programming journeys. I'm just wondering what it was like for, for you. Mm. Um, I think uh, the main thing is, um, I, the most important thing I think is motivation, right? Like you need to, 
like just feel like you're doing something that you're actually passionate about because if you're not then it will just be very easy for you to give up um so make sure to find something that like you actually are um, really passionate about um make sure i think um a social environment is like very important for this because otherwise if you're just uh, like dumping things into a keyboard it's very easy to just like not feel like you're getting uh like there's any result coming out of it um so and i think like the internet is actually getting better and better um ads like creating these uh, communities that people can just go in and join um and mm -hmm. uh, kind of just start do, um, doing work and showing things um so that that's something that's definitely important um yeah funny you should say that given i mean hack love has been a really great community inspired mm -hmm. a lot of people in here to go so that's oh, like, yeah. uh, maybe coincidental uh, I have a question, um, just, so I really like reading and I was wondering, like, what's a book that you would say kind of inspired maybe you to think about like what you've done, or maybe just something that you will quote when you like talk to you in the conversation, a book that really sticks with you. That's a good question. I feel like I, yeah, let's see. For me, like any article or blog post, something that's like stuck. Right. I mean, I've I've all like I've always been a big fan of the rationalist stuff. Like I mean, like like the yeah, like always read Kowski's sequences and like uh, a lot a lot of the kind of Harry Potter rationality. Yeah. Yeah. So that, uh, one of my favorite books. <laughs> yeah. From some of the Slate Store Codexes. Yeah. I, yeah. I just like really appreciate the way that the like the, that writing in particular is just like good like good at sort of distilling all of these philosophical concepts and like I, I also think I've learned a lot from that and uh, that I've applied to my own writing mm, interesting that's always what I've recently found myself in like a rabbit hole in rationality so that's kind of mm -hmm. cool yeah, yeah, 100%. Um, all right, next up is Ian. Ian, you want to go ahead and ask? Oh, before, before you start, I just want to point, we're at the halfway mark. So time flies really fast. I just wanted to mm -hmm. remind people that. Mm -hmm. All right, go ahead. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. Um, Ian? Ian, you want to go ahead? Yeah, hi, I'm Ian. I'm 13 and I live in Southern California. My question was, what do you think Ethereum will look like in five or 10 years? What's the future for like cryptocurrency? Do you think? What's the future for cryptocurrency like after the next five years? Um, yeah. I think uh, the biggest change that's going to happen in the next five years is that I think a lot of the big problems with uh, blockchains that people are complaining about today are going to be solved. So, like for example, a lot of people today, right, complain about the environmental issue. And like, that's a really big deal with blockchains as they exist today. But like Ethereum, for example, is moving to proof of stake this year, right? And uh, like Zcash, Dogecoin, lots of other chains are really considering moving to a proof, uh, to a proof of stake as well. Um, I mean, Bitcoin is not, but that's just like, big, but you know, the Bitcoin community is um, kind of has its own values and its and, and its own reasons for sticking with proof of work. Um, scaling is another one. Um, so people really complain about transaction fees today, right? That like you have to pay, um, you know, eight dollars to send a transaction on the Ethereum blockchain, and uh, that's. Uh, um, basically, it just makes the whole thing only accessible to people who already have a lot of money, um, which is like a good critique of um, you know like big uh, the big blockchains as they exist today. But there is a lot of like the scaling technology, like sharding, rollups, all of this stuff that will um, really just solve all of those problems uh, completely. Um, also, like things like security are big problems now, right? So, like yesterday, there was that uh, the mm -hmm. uh, Ethereum Solana bridge got hacked for about hundred million dollars. Um, which is like, of course, really terrible. Um, but like, that's just what happens with immature technology, right? Um, so, like, eventually the technology stops being immature, or eventually people figure out like what kinds of things are safe to do and what kinds of things are not safe to do. Um, so, you know, and um, you know, even today, right? Like, there are like things like exchange, like trading tokens are much safer than they were a few years ago, right? A few years ago, you had to like go and have an account on some exchange. And like maybe that exchange would disappear with your funds. And today you just like go and uh, 
I'm going to just do an Uniswap, right? So like there's all these kind of quiet things that are improving. Um, and I think five more years of those improvements like is the difference between, um, you know, blockchains basically just being kind of this toy that's uh, you know, useful for people who like really need specific applications, but otherwise just like too hard to use for a lot of people um, right. into something that actually is easy enough to use for a lot of people. And I think like, there's going to be really huge consequences coming out of that. Yeah, that's, that's super interesting. Um, I, I actually have a, a question that relates to that. Um, so generally, you know, when you're trying to scale blockchains in the real world, um, you mm -hmm. need to get a bunch of users, right? You need to make blockchains more accessible. Right. But at the same mm -hmm. time, you need to build tools for developers like Ethereum that allow them to build on things mm -hmm. a little bit more effectively. Um, so mm -hmm. I guess, you know, like, where do you, where do you see blockchain scaling? You know, which direction? Do you think there's going to be um, like more blockchains that focus on uh, you know, developing nations and like integrating them into nation states? Mm, I guess the question, like one of the questions of the, for a new developer is like, or do you even want to build a, uh, an app like, uh, a new blockchain or like, do you want to build a rollup or do you want to just build an application on the, on an existing blockchain, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I guess uh, like, if he wants to say build something for developing nations, then like even, even there, there's like a few different ways that you can try to tackle that problem, right? Like one way is to build yeah. a new chain and another way is to say like, I want to solve, um, let's say, you know, the specific problem of like helping like people in Latin America, let's say just like convert between their local currency and like any crypto assets. And then you just like go build like some kind of peer-to-peer -peer exchange um, or, you know, you decide like the thing you want to focus on is like give people a way like without access to traditional investments, a way to use like some kind of like mirroring or synthetic assets or whatever, a way to, um, you know, like invest, like either hold US dollars or hold Tesla or hold S&P 500 or whatever, and like oh. um, and just make that more accessible to everyone. Um, so like those kinds of things, like you can do as an application, right? But then also you could try to make the choice and say like, Hey, I'm going to like make a new chain that's, uh, that does those things. I guess the, like one of the one ch question there is like, when you make a, a new chain, you're basically choosing to make something that's kind of a, like more separate and like kind of more distinct from uh, the yeah, existing chains. Yeah. And you want to ask like, is that a good idea? Like, are there benefits from that that are worth the costs? I'm like, I think today, one of the big benefits of doing that, for example, is like, is just the lower transaction fees. But even there, right, that's actually only a temporary benefit um, because uh, the, uh, low, like, the transaction fees will be low when you have a few users, but once you have a lot of users, the transaction fees will just go back up and be really high again. Um, so I guess, the yeah, quite, but like you know, there there might be other benefits as well. Like you might be able to like give people really fast transactions, or you might be able to like stick some more cryptography into your chain and do things like have you know provably fair orders and be resistant to like uh, uh, against high frequency trading and those kinds of things. So like it depends on the application. Like sometimes you build a chain, sometimes you build an application. But you know, there, I think there, there's lots of things that you can build. Yeah, I think yeah, there's yeah, a lot totally. of strategy to mm -hmm. building a new app. Yeah, which you can yeah. kind of, some people kind of definitely align with that. In, yeah. on. I mean, it, it's super interesting to, to hear that, like, generally you don't, like, building a new chain and building a new product on that chain aren't necessarily mutually exclusive ideas. I, I really love that. Um, yeah, our, our next question comes from Mahir. Hey, yeah, I'm Mahir. I'm 15. Um, I live in Northern Virginia, which is near DC. Um, yeah, so. My question was about um, institutional adoption. So I was wondering what you thought of like different like legacy institutions uh, getting involved in crypto. Um, I think CBDCs are a good example. And then hmm. I was also wondering um, like how far do you think crypto is from uh, being able to be applied to solve like a lot of different issues? So like how far are we from like um, blockchain like news platforms or mm -hmm. um, like voting through like blockchain and these like different things. So I think currency is a great aspect of blockchain, mm -hmm. um, but there's like tons of issues. And I was right. wondering like how um, far you think uh, crypto can go and 
what's the role of institutions in the transition and then ultimately yeah uh, um i guess like to, like one to answer one kind of one part of that um one of the <coughs> kind of like non-currency um applications of ethereum that's been growing recently that um really excites me is uh, sign in with ethereum um this is just this idea that like you can use your ethereum accounts to you know sign into websites the same way that you can use your uh, facebook or twitter or google account to sign into websites except you know if you use an ethereum account then like you control it um so the whole thing is like it doesn't depend on this kind of company in the middle um and like the it's uh, and like the sign in with ethereum concept like it's actually it it kind of very easily extends to do a lot of really powerful things in ways that I think um, a lot of people don't realize, right? Because when you have an Ethereum uh, account, like often you also have an ENS name. And so like you have your username, like I'm Vitalik.eth, um, or you, know, you might, um, um, you know, maybe you can find um, Mahir.eth um, um, eventually. Um, there is, uh, like you can have attestations, like you know, you can have like proof of humanity verification. Um, you could have popes, the like proof of attendance protocol badges that prove that you like showed up to some, like participated in some events or completed some challenges. Um, so like you can really like extend it in a lot of ways, um, right? And this is it, it's something that like I'm seeing a lot of people quietly um, starting to adopt more and more. Um, there's even a chat application. Like if you go to chat.blockscan.com, like the, the Etherscan team, they basically just made a chat where you, like it's like Telegram, but where you sign into it with an Ethereum account, right? And like, it actually works really great. Um, so, uh, and like when the other night, like nice thing, right? Is that like, you don't even have to sign in for a separate account. Like actually, you know, if you have an Ethereum address, then you already have a chat.blogscan.com account. And like maybe other people sent you messages already. Um, so, which is, uh, you know, pretty fun. Um, so that's, um, yeah, so I, like, I'm definitely looking forward to people uh, kind of doing more exploration in that direction. Um, also, I'm like I've uh, posted and, and written a lot of this before, but I'm excited um, about um, the sign in with. Uh, uh, sorry, I, I'm excited about a smart contract wallet. Um, so, smart contract um, wallets are basically like instead of being controlled by one key, they can be controlled by many keys. Um, in uh, a way that like, and so, you know, if you lose one key, then like your account doesn't get lost or if you, or if you lose your key, some other keys can recover it. Um, I wrote a big long article about this, actually, if you go to uh, my blog, Vitalik.ca, and you just control F for social recovery, um, then like I yeah, really, uh, yeah, yeah, so, th so that's uh, the sort of thing that you can combine with this, right? So basic, like I think, Five years ago, people were talking about blockchain for identity. Um, and like, I've, I think at the time people did not really have a clear idea of like what it was, like what can you realistically do, what can't you do? And I feel like with these kinds of projects, like that, that sort of thing is finally actually happening. So you know, I'm excited about that. Yeah, um, actually it's really interesting. I guess you kind of talked about the proof of identity previously, but I think there recently been a lot of really, a whole flood of like proof of humanity projects that I've just seen everywhere um yes yeah, so like that i saw like a lot of deals and places like trying to fund and talk about so that's i guess like have you seen any interesting proof of humanity projects that you found interesting or like some mechanics of doing it that prevent like fraud or stuff prevent yeah fake? um i mean i think there's like different problems that you can solve in different ways right so like one of the problems for like, if we're talking about like preventing fraud, right? Like one of the things that you, one of the problems is just like the anti-spam problem. Mm -hmm. So like there's a lot of these, these block crypto messaging applications where one of the uh, problems that they uh, fall into are like just people create 10,000 accounts and then they use, start using 10,000 accounts to spam people. <laughs> um, and like if you use status for example like all the public chats they're just overwhelmed with like just crazy ads right uh that, like if i just pop into one of them right now like i'm just opening up my status wallet um <laughs> the top one is uh do you have a bitcoin wallet or coinbase wallet you can earn up to 0 0.06021 <laughs> every three hours with your phone or bc if you're interested ask me how 
Um, so yeah, it, totally. There's like, yeah, so that's like one level. And then like the um, other, and like you can fix that sort of stuff, but like proof of humanity attestations are one example. And you can combine that with your knowledge stuff to protect people's privacy. Um, right. There is like ENS names. Um, like basically, I think the way to fit, like the idea here, right, is that like if someone is uh, do like if some account is uh, just doing like queerly spammy or bad stuff, then like you as an individual should be able to ban it, um, and uh, mm, there awesome. should be uh, like obviously like there should be some infrastructure for making it more scalable. Like you know uh -huh. you could have chats with moderators, moderators could ban it, or you could like subscribe to ban lists from your friends. Okay. But then like in order to make that actually work you keep like you want people to not be able to just like spin up a new account um every like 500 times a second um, yeah so, I mean, yeah yeah so that's one problem you can solve i've noticed um, that a lot like you can post anything anywhere on any social media you have like a thousand bots um right, right. super annoying yeah um and the, another um exam uh, way to kind of think about the anti-fraud problem um is like actually yeah, like trying to create applications that like I can like adjudicate if there is like some really some kind of subjective um, situation where you know like there's something that happens and you have to try to like figure out like whether they cheated or not so like simple example would be like if you create like a blockchain based that decentralized eBay right um, so, you know, I send you your ETH and, or I send you my ETH, you send me your phone by mail. Like, did I ever actually get the phone? Um, oh, there sure, are, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, right, exactly. So mm -hmm. there's these decentralized arbitration things like uh, Queros is um, a good example that like try their best at solving the, that problem. Um, so that's also a project I'm uh, kind of like very yeah, excited about. That's really cool. Uh, that's interesting. Um, so. Uh, sorry about, um, yeah. So our next question comes from uh, Benjamin Smith. He has a quick. Yeah, um, before we get to the next question, just a quick reminder, we only have about 10 or 15 minutes left. So let's keep these questions a little bit shorter. Mm -hmm. Benjamin, you wanna go ahead? Yeah, sure. So I'm Benjamin, I'm 17 and from Seattle area. I have a bit of a weird question. Um, so on our Slack, we have a collection of pog emojis with various people. Uh, like we have one of Tom Preston Warner and uh, one of Rishi. And we'd like to add one of you. So could you make a pog face that we can screenshot and turn into an emoji? Wait, sorry, what face do you want me to make? Uh, it's like a pog face. I, I am not, I'm not entirely sure how to explain it. Can someone explain it? A, wait, a, a, a face frog of face or a prog face? Pog, P-O-G. Oh, how, how do you do the pog? Like, can... Just look super excited. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> in your soul. All right, sweet. Okay. Thank you so much. That will go down in yeah. history as a meme. Yeah, we'll <laughs> Forever immortalized in Hot Club. Perfect. Mm -hmm. So perfect. Mm. All right, sweet. Um, yeah, next up, uh, let's go for Lorenzo. Lorenzo Martinelli. Awesome. Um, so, hi, I'm Lorenzo. I am 17 and I'm from Kentucky. Um, my question is as Hack Clubbers grow and create new, new technologies, what values, societal, moral, et cetera, do you hope that they instill in their work? Mm. Um, I think the uh, like the big the the big kind of picture social value that I hope that blockchains can accomplish is basically get, like creating ways for people to um, cooperate um, without um, like needing to have uh, like you know someone uh, be in. Uh, like be in the in control and kind of at the center of all uh, of uh, everything that's happening right so like actually you know being able to kind of make big projects that like just require lots of people to work together but without like that turning into an opportunity for um you know a small group of people to basically kind of like control and get into a position of power over everyone else um i feel like like this is like the big thing that um I think a lot of people want, like, I think there's this big, like, realization, right, that, uh, you know, like, first of all, like, you know, we did, we, we do need to do a lot of big things, um, and uh, a, a lot of big things need, uh, 
need to happen if we want to have this kind of amazing 21st century where all of this uh, like really cool technology gets uh, developed and you know we solve uh, global poverty and all of these things um but um you know at the same time there's also just these concerns that happen when like say someone you know you have these like networks like facebook to just like show up um and then 10 years later you have like basically one person that can kind of control the ch a channel through which a billion people get um, get all of their information um, so like combining those two, the, or kind of trying to get the best of both worlds there is like the, one of the big things that I yeah, um, really hope to see um, come out of the, yeah, uh, uh, of the crypto space. Um, another thing I kind of hope to see more um, is, or one of the things that I really love that the crypto space has uh, actually been good at is uh, empowering people globally, right? So like, for example, there is uh, this big crypto community in um, Argentina, right? And <laughs> that's, that's sorry, am I? It looks like is the uh, internet okay? It just feels I'm. Yeah, no, you're all good. Sorry, yeah, there is this. Okay, yeah, no, perfect. Yeah, so there's this like really lovely uh, crypto community in Argentina, um, and the uh, like they've actually created these like amazing projects in the yeah, crypto space. That, every, that people know about all around the world, right? Like there is uh, Open Zeppelin, um, there's uh, Gnomic Labs, um, Cleros has some people there, um, Proof of Humanity has, uh, um, um, has some of its team there, MakerDAO has some of its team there. Mm -hmm. And so like these people, um, you know, they're like from like the, you know, the deep south of Latin America, like they've uh, managed, well, um, well, um, they, they've managed to like um, create something that like even, um, you know, like like everyone in the like Ethereum community in uh, Canada and, and in the United States just you know, like knows and loves. And that's not something that they were really able to do with like centralized Web2 tech, right? Like centralized Web2 tech was yeah. like very centered around like, you know, you have to be in Silicon Valley to make a big difference. Yeah. And, Ethereum is like the opposite of that, right? Like half the team is European. There's these amazing communities in Argentina. There's always, uh, you know, lovely people, including yourselves, dialing in from places like India. Um, and, and, you know, there's like a community in- There's um, like a know, lot of like, amazing yeah. ideas and projects that are just, they're all in different time zones. And it's just kind exactly. of insane how it just really works. It just, really, mm -hmm. it, it just works somehow. And I think that's really, really magical with Ethereum. Yeah. Super interesting. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, all right. We only have a couple of minutes left. So, um, Vitalik, we have a little bit of a challenge for you. Can you answer five questions in the next five minutes? Sure. Well, I uh, guess it's one. like three minutes. Okay. Yeah. Well, well, okay. Yeah. Let's do, we'll do the rapid fire. Let's try this. All right. So we, we yeah. Um, all right. First up, uh, Lavanya, do you want to go? Um, yeah. Hi, Vitalik. My name is Lavi. I'm an 18 year old student from the U.S. This is Los Angeles. Um, so my question is about cybersecurity. Um, we've been hearing a lot about cybercrime and hackers targeting cryptocurrency exchanges. Um, so I'm just curious, what do you think the biggest challenge is in implementing security policies um, within crypto specifically? Mm, um, I think uh, crypto is like doing cybersecurity well in crypto is different from doing cybersecurity well in the traditional space in, in, in like ways that a lot of people don't realize well. So like, for example, like take the spam problem, right? Like the way that that people like Gmail solve the spam problem is they use AI and try to like detect spam, right? And like it's very AI heavy. But the problem with a lot of those algorithms is that it's hard to make them open because once you make them open, then, then everyone can see how to attack them. And so, you know, in like to do spam prevention, like in these open environments, effectively, you know, you have to do things like um, the, um, in the like, economic stuff, like um, symbol resistance, proof of humanity, kind of all of these other things. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, um, so like, like adapting to that different paradigm is um, I think a challenge, but if you do man um, adapt uh, like to it, then like you can create systems that are both safe and um, very open, which I think is uh, like in the long term more safe. Right, oh, that's really cool. Uh, so our next question comes from Henry. Uh, Henry. All right. Okay. Um, sorry about that. Then I guess Tarek, do you want to ask your question? Hey, awesome. Uh, thank you, Vitalik, for being here. Uh, and my question was, how do you think blockchain will affect like politics and governmental structure going forward? And I guess, I guess like governance in general. 
Mm, um, I think, um, I mean, two ways to answer this question. Like one way is to, is like the ways in which blockchains can interact with uh, like existing government policies. So like, you know, can, to what extent like can monetary policy, like to what extent will it have to change when people always have like this option of using a cryptocurrency um, to what extent like, you know, will like some foreign policy tools against like certain countries continue, um, continue to work well on all of these questions. Um, I think, on the, like my general viewpoint on those questions is that like, or another one is like, you know, will taxes still be enforceable if we have like more anonymous money? My viewpoint on all, on all of those questions is that I think like governments will need to adapt, but I think that like the people who are saying that like cryptocurrency will make governments collapse completely, whether they're saying this because they, <laughs> because they're afraid of that or because they want that. Like, I think that viewpoint is wrong. Um, it being just like, because um, like, I do think that um, you know, like governments still have a lot of power, especially like, like in meat space, and there's a lot that cryptocurrency can't touch, right? Like you can't use Bitcoin to, or Ether to evade your property taxes, right? Like it's a piece yeah. of land. They can look at it. You, know, you can't like throw, send your lands through tornado cash or whatever. Yeah. But like, so that's one way to think about it. The other way to think about that question is uh, like, might there be mechanisms that are kind of like developed and improved on blockchains that eventually make their way their way over and try to improve the way that like we you know we run our democracies right and things like Gitcoin quadratic funding for example like I think could actually be a a, a really good um, example of that yeah uh, oh I think a lot of us are really inspired by Gitcoin so yes. that's something we've been super interested in so, um, so. yeah all right so since I, I know you said a message Thank and you have to leave soon mm -hmm. um well you have a quick question from Zach a lot of yeah. if you have time to mm -hmm. listen to that one. Awesome. Well, hey, Vitalik, thank you so much for being here. Um, I also just want to say thank you, you know, so much for donating to Hack Club earlier this year. It, it keeps our community going. And I don't know, I mean, it's, it's just like the biggest honor in the world to have you involved. Um, I know you said you have a hard stop. So if you have a hard stop, we can stop right now. And thank you so much for being here. But I have one question. If you have sure. two minutes, or if you don't, question. Totally okay. okay. So Say when you got on this call, you click the Zoom join link and suddenly you find yourself teleported back to the year 500 BC. You have no idea how you got there. You don't know how it happened, but everyone around you is treating you like you're the dictator of the world. And you also find out that you are on one of three identical Earths and that in the year 2022, in 2,522 years from now, there's gonna be a great war between these three Earths uh, and only one Earth is gonna survive. The question is, what do you do as dictator of the world in the year 500 BC to best increase your Earth's chance of survival? There's three constraints. The first is that you only know what you know right now. You can't bring anything back with you, but you have everything in your head at the moment. Mm -hmm. The second is that you can assume you're not gonna like die from horrible disease or something like that, but you only have the rest of your life to set your plans in motion. So you don't have mm -hmm. 2000 years, you have to use the rest of your life. And mm -hmm. the third constraint is it is 500 BC, you're limited accordingly, you know, somehow you're dictator of the world, who knows if you say something, if other people know this side of the world are here before you die, and the war okay. is inevitable. Like you can assume three years in one box, one comes out, diplomacy is not an option. What do you do? Mm -hmm. um, so I think the first part of the question, I think, should be to like whatever place I end up in, convince people that like I actually know my stuff and I'm not crazy. Um, one good way of doing that might be to just draw a very good map of the world. Like that's not something that was really available to, um, you know, people five, like in uh, 500 BC. Um, but like that is something that I kind of, you know, like a lot of us just kind of have in our heads now. Um, and even like just being able to, I mean, there's also like basic facts that we know, like, hey, you know, the, the diameter of the earth is uh, 12,700 kilometers. And we know, and uh, we know that some of the, the different ways of how to prove it, um, you know, we know like actually what is up north and what, and, and what is down south. So that would be step one. And then step two would definitely just be kind of like, right communicating as many of the shortcuts to like important scientific knowledge as we can um, as, as possible. Um, so one example um, of that would just be like all, you know, all of the important mathematical theorems. Um, like we could basically just like, you know, immediately <laughs> yeah, tell people that like, you know, how calculus works um, and like potentially even like- Literally a zero knowledge proof. 
Right. Yeah. Like, well, I mean, in this case, it would be a full knowledge proof, right? You like actually give them the knowledge, right? Step one is oh, proving. Yeah. Step two is like, yeah, you teach them how all the Newton stuff works. You teach them how all the um, all of the um, uh, um, Einstein works. Well, you just write that down so they can understand in a couple of centuries and just kind of try to uh, uh, try to accelerate things as uh, much as possible. Um, and then. I don't know. I don't think there is a step three. Like maybe the best step three is to just like just in case like that one particular like something bad happens to that one particular civilization, maybe just like uh, try to uh, um, try to spread that knowledge more. Um, maybe yeah, try to. Um, yeah, I don't know. Like, I, I think depending on what happens during those first two steps, like basically, like try to figure out, like, like you know, what I want to kind of restart doing that same thing somewhere else, or what I want to like basically take my position as the dictator of like uh, kind of the trust, the now trusted dictator of whatever civilization I'm in, and like actually, yeah, um, you know, create some kind of structure that doesn't like waste people's time on on like wars and disease and like you know makes it easy for pe for people to like actually yeah, do stuff and uh you know have like have their um their economies and just like feels, science and so forth yeah i don't know that feels a lot That's like what have you been doing with ethereum Good, so. beautiful yeah. awesome so, so to wrap us up we have a we have a traditional hack mode we all put our hands down out and we count three two one and we all shout hack um yeah. let's all do that together and i think vitalik just popped out no, um, I'm still here. Um, oh, here. Do you want to leave the countdown? Sure. Um, okay. Three, two, two one. 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 Hack. Hack. Thank you so much. It was so amazing to see you. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thanks so much, Vitalik. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great Bye. Day. Have, a day. Have a great day. See you when you teach Denver. <laughs> Thank you. Is that a moment? Yeah. Oh, my God. So we need to talk about how we didn't ask him about our Lord and Savior, Prophet Orpheus. Loki, I can't <laughs> Bro, we need to get I him into the Apple Slack. Slack. I, yes. I love your question about NFTs. I really wanted to ask someone to solve the NFTs, and I was so sad we didn't get into NFTs, but you know what? Such is life.